Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today I'm going to be talking about five telescopes that should exist but don't. You know, sometimes when I'm hanging out with the guys, I'll say to them, you know, it would really be great if they made XYZ. And over the years, I've compiled a list of these wish list items that I think really should be on the market, but for some reason, no manufacturer has done this yet. So let's take a look. Now, my decades-long troubled relationship with the ETX is well documented online. I think I may have been the only major outlet in the mid-1990s to give this thing a negative review. Now, in the beginning, they were promising that this thing was going to be a Questar for $495, and I think it was accompanied by what has to be the most aggressive marketing campaign I think I've ever seen on behalf of a telescope. And through the years, they've tried to change the thing up and they've issued new models, but to me, most of these have been lateral moves. For example, first they came out with different apertures. There was a 105 and then there was a 125. Again, lateral moves, but in higher apertures. They came out with a PE edition, the professional edition, which fixed some things, you know, some things got better, but I don't think that they addressed any of the longstanding issues with that product. That is with a lot of plastic in it, the drive base is having issues with both pointing accuracy and long-term reliability. I was really enthusiastic when they announced the refresh a few years ago and they came out with the Observer series, but when I saw one, again, it seems like it's a lateral move. Some things got better. I mean, they made the tube easier to take off. It's almost an admission to me on Mead's part that you're going to do it anyway because the drive base isn't very good. But again, they didn't do anything to address the long-standing problems of the cheap plastic construction. And I was just disappointed. Again, a lateral move for the Observer series in the backpack. So what I would suggest to Mead is do what you originally promised. Deliver the product that you said you were going to do when all of this got started. Give me a legitimate Questar contender at a fraction of the price. You don't have to sell it for $399 or $499 or $549 or whatever they're going for right now. You can charge me a little bit more. Build it right. Make it all metal. I forbid you to use plastic. You have done that already. It didn't work. And if you were to do that, I would buy one. That's right, me, after 25 years of trashing the ETX in all of these reviews, if you built it right, I would buy one. So you know, an eight inch Dobsonian telescope has long been considered the ideal starting telescope. It is cheap, it's easy, it's fun to use, it's gonna teach you a lot, and it's gonna last you a long time possibly even forever. Given the enormous number of these Dobbs that are out there, I'm surprised that nobody has really come out with a premium version of one of these. Now, there have been some attempts in the past. For example, Starmaster had the Versa 8, the V8 version. That was an interesting telescope. It didn't sell very well. I think I've only seen maybe one of those in my lifetime. There was an 8-inch Portaball. Gained some success, but not really in the mainstream. Starmaster also had the Oak Classic, but as we all know, there have been so few of those made. Those things are collector's items. Now, through the years, Orion has tried to upscale some of these models. They have the deluxe version. I've seen some of those. They're a little bit better in some ways. I'm not sure the word deluxe truly applies to that. They've just upgraded some of the parts. I'm not really sure that would be a premium product. They've also tried the Intelliscope version, but again, they're just putting a lot of electronics on the standard base model. I think right now, the closest thing that we have to a premium Dobsonian is that new Explore Scientific First Light series. Now, if you look, you'll see that they've done a lot of things to try to get away from this commercial grade stuff, and they're trying to do something extra. Those are better, and I do recommend those. But I'd really like to see a premium 8-inch Dobsonian from one of the high-end manufacturers. And I think the natural guy to do this would probably be Obsession. Wouldn't it be cool if we had an 8-inch Open Truss Obsession? Yeah, it's going to cost a lot, but wouldn't that be neat? It would collapse into nothing. It would be so cute, you know. Uh, I think the problem, though, with these small companies is that, you know, with the capacity that he has, he may not be able to turn these things out in large numbers. But maybe one of the other premium manufacturers will see this, see that there's a market for it, and they'll take action.
So back in the 1980s, Takahashi, which is mainly known for their high-end refractor line, they did make a line of Newtonians. The one that I see probably advertised the most often on the used market is the MT-130. That's the 5.1-inch F6 model. Every time I see one of those come up for sale, I think about buying one. Owners rave about them. Wouldn't it be cool if they brought those back? Now, in the 1980s, they made a big line of these up to, you know, the 250s and the 300. I mean, wow, look at that. Isn't that amazing? They could very easily bring these things back and bring them into the modern age, you know, get rid of all that cast iron to lighten up the tube. They did do this because there was a large cult following for the Takahashi FC series of refractor, and they did bring those back. They modernized them, they're lighter, and so they do listen to their customers. So maybe, just maybe, we can get a cool Takahashi Newtonian for us all to play with. Ah, am I allowed to dream about this one? Just, just give me a minute. Just, I mean, in those moments before sleep, I think I can convince myself that this thing actually exists. It's the Astrophysics AP60, a 60 millimeter F5.8 triplet APO refractor. I chose that F ratio because that's the F ratio of the original AP Traveler. This would be so cool. I mean, if they were to announce this thing, I'm sure the waiting list would be tremendous. Waiting lists, of course, are no stranger to Astrophysics customers. I've seen people wait seven to 10 years. I waited 19 years for my Astrophysics stowaway. The stowaway, by the way, does take up the mantle as the entry level. That's the smallest of the Astrophysics refractors. But through the three versions of the stowaway, that thing has gotten, it's larger. I don't know if it really fits the spirit of the word stowaway. A 60 millimeter F5.8 would be really tiny, it'd be so cute. That is a true stowaway telescope. Now, I know Takahashi does make an FS60 CB, that is a 60 millimeter F5.9 apochromatic refractor. They are very nice telescopes. I know I have two of them. But you know, in cars, for example, you know, you have BMW fans, Mercedes, and Lexus. Very rarely do you see those people swap brands. Usually they stick to a brand and they're loyal to it. And I think the same thing is true with both Takahashi and Astrophysics. You're either in one camp or in the other. I think I'm perceived as being in the Takahashi camp, and in a way I am. I really like their products. But part of the reason is because you can actually get them. So it's very hard to buy an Astrophysics refractor unless at this point you know somebody. So this, I think, is probably the coolest telescope that's listed here, even though I think it's probably the least useful. If I had the, all of these, I'd probably use this one the least. Probably wouldn't use the ETX a lot either. That would just be a cool thing to have. But wouldn't it be amazing if they came out with an AP60? So finally, at number one, this is actually the one that I think I want the most because this is the product I think I'd probably use it more than the others. I'd probably use the premium 8-inch DAB also, but I have been lobbying Celestron for a long time to make a Celestron C7 and a quarter. What is that? It's a nine and a quarter that's been scaled down to seven and a quarter size. Now, why would I want this? Okay, so as many of you know, the Celestron C9 and a quarter is my favorite Schmidt Cassegrain of all time. My one minor complaint, it's really minor, is it's just a tad on the big and heavy side. The focal length is just a tad on the long side, and it becomes difficult to get low power out of it just a little bit. A C7 and a quarter, you take the nine and a quarter design aesthetic and then you scale it down just a little bit and it would fit on a mid-size mount. It's easier to get low power out of the thing and it retains that design aesthetic of the longer, the longer narrower aspect ratio that you see in the nine and a quarter and get tack sharp images. Now, when I mentioned this to a Celestron employee at a trade show, they said, well, why do we want a C7 and a quarter when we have a C6? And to which I replied, well, you got a C9 and a quarter and you have a C8, and those are pretty close on paper at least, but in the mind of the amateur and especially the collector, those two products are very far apart. And I think the same thing would be true of the six and the seven and a quarter. So 
I bring this up at trade shows to Celestron employees whenever I can, and they usually nod and they smile and they say, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll take it under advisement. I think some of them are just actually being nice to me, but if they were to actually do this, boy, I would be first in line to get one. Okay, folks, so there you have it. Five telescopes that don't exist, but they should. Do you have a telescope model in mind that they don't make, but you think that they should? Please let us know in the comments below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.